Carolyn Harris. Gloria. It's nice to see you and again. You. And you. Miss you in the tea room. <laughs> I miss that tea room. <laughs> That's the. We should just say yeah. that that I I used to, I knew that I shouldn't be an MP anymore because I kept telling to pros, pros, prospective candidates the best thing about being an MP was the tea room, mm. and I thought this is probably not the mm. the, the right thing mm. to do. No, tea room's nice place to be. <laughs> nice place. Nice food. It is good food, isn't it? What's your favourite? Oh, combi fash. Oh, is it the combi fash? fash. <laughs> yeah, lovely. Um, Caroline, how old were you when you left school? Sixteen. Any qualifications? No. Not a GCSE to my name or O-level as it was then. Yeah, nothing. You're an intelligent woman. Uh, or tell me, wh why, why do you think you left school with no qualifications? Well, because I remember going to the careers office and I wanted to be a medical doctor. Ridiculous, I know, but I wanted to be a medical doctor. And I remember going to the careers lesson and saying, uh, she said, what do you want to do? And I said, I'd love to be a, a medical doctor. And I remember her saying to me, now, come on, ODA, let's be realistic about this. And I think that just put me on that path that um, I'm not good, at, good enough for this kind of thing. So I didn't do it. And uh, I went to work in the civil service when I was 16. What were you doing? Because that sounds like oh, a grand job. It wasn't. It was in the DVLA. So I was yes. literally opening letters. Opening letters. It was a conveyor belt. We opened letters with an, um, a slicer thing, took out the postal orders, franked the postal orders, Clipped it all together with a little yellow card and on a conveyor belt and off it would go. And I worked there until I was pregnant for Martin. And then when I was expecting Martin, I had um, really bad back through my pregnancy and I ended up going on the sick and never went back when I had Martin. How old were you when you had Martin? Uh, 20. I was nearly 21 when I had Martin. How old were you when you got married? Um, 19, going on for 20, just before my 20th birthday. Really? Mm. So. How long had you been with your husband? Not long. Not long? No, not long. Um, two years. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah. Decent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Reasonable amount of time, I suppose, yeah. And then you have your first child, yeah. Martin. Yeah. Age uh, 20. Yeah. And that was in the January. Um, and I just didn't think... Well, I just couldn't believe it. I just loved this this child so much. I can I can see him now. He was like, oh God, I just couldn't believe how much love I had in my heart for him. Nothing else seemed to matter except for Martin. It was a really weird sensation. So when I found out I was having my second son, Stuart, I remember thinking to myself, have I got enough love for two of them? Of course, Stuart came into the world and all of a sudden you realise you, you love doubles and you can, you are capable of loving them both the same. So... I had the two boys, I was working behind the bar, and I was happy. So did you, you worked behind the bar, was that good for like um, childcare arrangements, or what, so how well, did yeah, you end up working it, behind the we, bar? We lived, we, li we lived right by my, my mum and dad, so it was easy. My boys were in my mother's house, and my house just as much as one another, you know, it was just like an extent, extension of our house, and uh, um, my, so it, I could go to work of an evening, um, and there was always someone to look after, the boys, especially Martin, when when I only had Martin, and I liked working behind the bar. It was a social club. Um, it was the you know one of the top social clubs in Swansea, um, and we had some really big turns there. And it was bingo. We did. I remember uh, we had some really big turns and um, thinking I'd seen superstars. No, I saw superstars. I saw I saw Bernard Manning live. <laughs> no, I've seen the best. Um, and we played bingo. Took it in turns to play bingo. And I just thought, oh, I like this. This is lovely. And do you know? It's fine. So I can now picture that social mm. club. There's a turn. Oh, there's God, bingo. Yeah. It was bread and dripping. Was there any? No, no? it no. was pasties and am rolls. Pasties and am rolls. The stewardess made the am rolls, and it was pasties and occasionally pies if you were lucky. Yeah. Do you know? Because I remember like those working class mm. social clubs when when I was growing up too. I'm not. They're sort of dying. Oh, God, yeah, yeah. 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 Dying is sort of generous that mm. you may struggle to find them. I think something like Bernard Manning. What would, what would happen in, in this day I don't and think age? he'd be in the Cavalling Club, no. I think no. the women on the committee now would have had something to say about it. But uh, there weren't women on the committee then. You know, nobody questioned that. The yeah. committee was men, and they wanted Bernard Manning. And I, rem I can remember him clearly being there. I remember thinking, oh, I don't think I like many of his jokes, but, you know, yeah. they all thought he was wonderful. So you, 
were you, I bet you were a good barmaid, weren't you? I bet you were great with the punters. Yeah, we, there was me and my friend Jill, and we always seemed to work the till together. And Boxing Day and New Year's Eve were fantastic for tips. And we were really fast. And we got made in our business to know what people's round was. So only once you had to tell us. And when we knew you were on our way back up, we'd be prepping. You know, so yeah, we did we were good barmaids, I gotta say. We were we were brilliant. We loved it and when I worked behind a barmaid, whenever anyone said uh, and, and one for yourself, you you'd take the money yeah. rather than get the yeah. drink. Is that is yeah, that? I think it was yeah. about twenty pence then I think it was. But you know, Christmas over yeah. Christmas and New Year, you could you know, literally you could make a blinking fortune on the on the, the tips and, and we loved it. And we'd come up with like um new cocktails. I can remember us putting together this blue thing. It must have been vile, but people were buying it. But no, it was like baby sham and some blue drink and some yeah. vodka and stick a, a cherry on the top and say, I think we called it something like blue Hawaii, but they loved it. I know. Because it was blue. Yeah. Oh, can we have the cocktail that those two have come up with? You know, we were on, we were quits in then. Loved it. What does it mean when you're a barmaid and you get tips? Like, how how important is it to you for because you'll, you'll have had some stingy customers yeah and some yeah. generous ones and we knew the stingy ones yeah mm, make them wait a bit longer yeah so for today's barmaids if they get they'll be stingy customers still in yeah. their locals w what would you say to <laughs> stingy keep customers keep them waiting <laughs> keep them waiting you look after the ones you know are going to give you a tip because at the end of the day no, I mean, those tips meant a huge amount to us. I can remember those tips were like more than what we earned over the weekend because yeah. they were good at Christmas. Yeah. Um, and that was massively important to us. It, it meant the difference between paying for something or buying something for ourselves, which we wouldn't normally be able to do. So I know it was brilliant. So you're working in a bar. Um, what's, what's your husband doing? He works on the railway. He was on the, he was on the tools then, as they call it. So he would actually be on the track and he did, he, by the time he finished, because he retired when he was early redundancy retired, he had a computer and uh, um, he had a laptop, so he, he progressed a lot. He'd come on a treat, but originally, you know, it does not seem he did much work, <laughs> but he did have, he did have tools. You're painting, you know, a, a, an, an idyllic, an idyllic family mm. home. You, 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 you know, you, you're obviously not rich, but you, you're both working, you're getting by for tips of mm. goods, it mm. means a huge amount to you. You've got two children mm. who you love dearly. Mm. When Martin, your firstborn, is eight years old, mm. he dies in a traffic accident. How, what, what was the nature of the accident? It was a Sunday afternoon. Um, he crossed over the road to go and see his friend. It was quiet, and you know, I, I can I can picture it all now. It was horrendous. It was the worst time ever. And I can remember when I got to the hospital to see Martin. Um, I can see him now dressed up in in foil. Um, and I, I mean, Martin wouldn't thank me for this, but Martin had a problem with wetting the bed, and I was really worried that he hadn't wet the bed in the hospital. And I can remember really stressing over. You know, as he wet the bed, and on his hands he had a felt pen, and I was like, "Can we clean his hands? I don't want him to look as if he's you no." Know. Uh, and it was just awful, absolutely awful. And I and I think losing Martin was the worst thing that ever happened. But I walked away from that hospital where it happened, and they the first person came to see me or in the hospital before I left, and she said, um, "I'm a social worker." Well. That was just it. I just put me over the edge. I mean, I I now know it was about whether you know, they, they, I didn't have counselling, but it was it was more about a bereavement of losing a child in hospital. But you know, you come from a working class area, a child is laying in a hospital bed, and they say I'm a social worker. It was like, oh my god, it was horrendous. I never forget that. And you know, there was a conversation about organ donation, which I was ugh, unbelievable. I I just. Those are the things I think which now really pain me around that time of losing Martin. Um, but I've moved on from it, I suppose. But I'll never move on from moving Martin. And, you know, I see his face every day, think about him every day, call his name every day. I mean, especially now when I you know the menopause brain, and I go through the whole list of every male in my life when I want one person's name, including the cat. You no, know, but Martin, I say his name every day. 
every day. How did you find out that Martin had been involved in a traffic accident? Telephone call. A telephone call. Um, and then we ran up the hospital. And when I rushed into the hospital, the first person I saw was my vicar. And I loved, I loved going to church. I loved my vicar. And I saw him, and I knew when I saw him that this was really bad news. Really, really bad news. And then for two years, I couldn't even look at my vicar. I, I didn't want to think about going to church or anything. And I really loved my vicar. Like, I, he'd, he'd christened me, he'd christened the boys, you know, Mr Newbury, I loved him. And I remember him saying to my mother, as long as she's not talking to me, then there's, she, we haven't lost her. And then within about two or three years, I started going back to church and I took Stuart to Sunday school and I took taking Tom to Sunday school, my grandson to Sunday school. I, I, mean, I don't go to church every week, but you know, I did lose my faith for about two years where I just was so angry that God could do this and take away my son who was perfect. Um, and people will say things like, when they see photographs of him, they'll say, oh, he was an angel, he wasn't meant for this world. And I, and I remember when he was about three, and this was a massive thing for us because the, the, the big paper in Wales at the time was the Western Mail and they were doing a fashion show and they were looking for um, a little boy to be in the fashion show to model um, page boy outfits. And somebody said, I've seen a little boy and he's absolutely gorgeous. And I can see Martin now on the catwalk, walking down to um, uh, the song by, um, oh, Wings of a Dove. To Wings of, I can see him walking down in little velvet trousers with a frill white shirt. And that's an everlasting memory in my mind. And people would say after that, because that photograph was used a lot when I lost Martin, that he wasn't meant for this world. Well, he was, he was mine, he was meant for this world. But, but you no, know, I suppose if it wasn't for losing Martin, I probably wouldn't be here now and wouldn't have done some of the things I've done because it was losing, I think when you lose a child, you can go one or two ways, you either go up or you go down. And I lost Martin and plateaued for two years, literally, maybe three years. Well, I didn't, I didn't even function as, as a normal human being. And David used to say to me, don't you think you should wash and do you think you should cook tea? And because you just think nothing else is worth living. But when I came out to that, that's when I decided I needed to do something and, and ended up going to university. But you know, I could have gone either way. I could have gone down, but I didn't. Did you take antidepressants? No, Did you at the time, no, I didn't. Not then. I refused them. So I just had to work it out myself. Did you have counselling? No, nothing. Nothing. No. Why? It just wasn't a thing then, Gloria. I mean, yeah. you know, it's back in 1989, and you know, it was only posh people had counselling. You know, it was only, um, you know, it was like it was a big thing in America. Therapy. You know, we yeah. didn't working yeah. class people like me didn't have that. So no, nothing. Do you think you'd have benefited from it? How would you know? I guess. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I think I've had counselling since for other things, but I do often wonder whether you know, the deep rooted thing with me. Because I think a lot of people will get a little bit of mental health. And obviously, I've had mental health issues. And I think that's probably at the bottom of it. But it's so mixed up now with all the other emotions over the years that have piled in on top of it that um, maybe I would have benefited, I don't know. But it was just it wasn't a thing that happened. They didn't have um, charities or third sector organisations doing work around that time. It was just it was one of the things. It happened, and you, know, you had to get on with it. You said you've had counselling for other issues. Mm. You don't have to tell me about it. Do you want to? Yeah, I mean, depression. I've had cognitive behaviour therapy. Um, and I've had, you know, there have been times when I've been felt myself going back into a dark place. I, I, I mean, I now know I was menopausal, but there was a time I thought I was having a nervous breakdown. And I literally spent six months in a pink anorak with a hood up. And I had counselling then. Um, and we didn't find out what the problem was. We just had this counselling and it did help me. And then, you know, I started to learn that the glass is half full, not half empty, which is something which has been with me now. And now I tend to do think that it is half full, not half empty. But I, I just wonder sometimes maybe the underlying issue has always been losing Martin um, and the menopause didn't help. And that's when how I went on antidepressants. And how old were you when you went on antidepressants and had CBT? 50. 50. So I went so on them so in 2010. Oh gosh. Mm. 
Just so before you're elected to Parliament? Five years five before. Five years before yeah. you're elected to Parliament. Yeah, so it's a long did it journey. Did, was it hard to come off? Or maybe I'm you're still, you're still on I'm, the I'm weaning. I've gone on HRT yes. and I'm finding that since I've gone on HRT that I'm able to cut back on the antidepressants and I'm hoping to come off them completely. But I've always been afraid to come off them because yeah. I was afraid that I'd go back to being the person in the pink anorak with a hood up. You know, and because all these things come back and haunt you, don't they? Like Matt losing Martin, Martin's funeral. Then I lost my parents. I lost my dad New Year's Eve this year. I lost my mum um, in 2014. I'm an only child, so you know, I've gone through the I'm an orphan thing the first half of this year. It was like I'm an orphan now, and it's horrible. All these things. I can't. There's nothing I've ever have happened in my life since losing Martin when I haven't thought. If only Martin was here, you know, I, it's, he's been such a massive part of everything. Without him being here, he's still the centre of our world. By the way, whilst, while I've been talking to you, I've noticed you've got a tattoo. Yeah, that's my baby's name, Thomas. But he's not baby, he's 20 in August. <laughs> the first one at 50. You had your first tattoo at 50? Yeah, yeah. What were you thinking of? <laughs> I don't know, I've been, I've been thinking about it for a while and I thought, oh, I'm going to have it, so I did. did I've it had four, oh, it's, it's a pain that you start to love. I've got four of them now, <laughs> but I'm not having any more. <laughs> you got four tattoos? Yeah, I've got, four, yeah. I've got one there, I've got one on each foot, and i got a bow on my back. And you did that at 50? Yeah. Mad. <laughs> Mad. <laughs> this was around the time that you went on antidepressants? Before, it was <laughs> before. just before. <laughs> I probably wouldn't have gone on them. <laughs> okay. Now, we've talked about you being a barmaid, which mm. is, by any definition, a working class job. Mm. You have another working class job. Mm. You're a dinner lady. Mm. Yeah, that was, that was very interesting because that was working with um, children with profound physical and mental disabilities. Profound. Um, and that was tough, but really rewarding. But it was tough. I mean, that was, you know, there was never any... A, a, an achievement would be to, to get one of the children to drink from a, a cup and to actually understand that they've taken a sip from a cup. It was tough, hard going work, but but it was a lovely environment to be with those kids and it was lovely to, to see any development they made and I loved it there. Like a family. Were you a good dinner lady? I think so. I must have been a good dinner lady because they used to ask me to go in when people were on the sick. When the, yeah. It's a very stressful job, so people would be always phoning in sick so I ended up working in the classroom a lot and um, so I must have been okay I must have been good with the kids. Did you eat school dinners oh yourself? Oh god yeah. 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 What's your favourite school dinner? Oh, Betty's chicken and mushroom pie and sponge um, cake with pink custard but it had to be Betty's. So Betty was the cook? Oh Betty was the cook yeah <laughs> she was the queen of the kitchen. <laughs> and um, oh yeah that sounds like a, that's made yeah. me hungry that. Good you probably fun. wouldn't be able, I don't know what school dinners are like now, but no, I bet I'm they'd be like, oh, you're not having that pie, no, you're not having can't. that pink custard. It's, they don't have anything now, do they? It's all very healthy. <laughs> Is that progress? I don't know. <laughs> I think they're missing a lot. Especially Betty's pink custard. It never does any harm, did it? No, definitely not. Um, very, very hard to imagine the trauma of losing your son mm. no it's 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 impossible for anybody to who has not lost a child t to have any comprehension of what that would mean and how you deal with it and how you get through that you go to university as a mature student mm. so just so how so you would have been 20 i was uh, 34 going to university but you're 28 when you lost yeah 29 29 yeah. when you lost martin mm. and Four years later, were you a barmaid or a dinner lady just before? I was a, I was a dinner lady a dinner when I went to university. So you go, mm. right, mm. I am... Where did you get this idea from? Well, it's a funny story because I'd been working lunchtime in the school and was working a lot of hours in the classroom. And we didn't have a teacher at the time because the teacher had gone off sick. And I kept thinking, well... They trust me, so maybe I could do something a little bit more, go for a teaching qualification or something. And I'm walking into, into the town centre, and I passed the job centre, and there was a jobs fair. And I went in, and the first stall was a stall from the Department of Continuing Education from Swansea University. And they were doing a foundation course, which was to teach you how to be a student, 
and then they were doing some interesting courses around Welsh social history, American studies, Jack Kerouac and Thelma and Louise and so I thought oh I like the sound of that so I went and they said oh we need to do an aptitude test so I did the aptitude test and they said well you could either be a brain surgeon or an astronaut so well there's not a lot of call for either in Swansea so um, I'll come on the course so I went on the course and then when I was on the course after a year well after like nine months they said oh you need to apply now to go full-time university and I thought you were having a laugh they're not going to take me in university applied had an interview and then got this letter to say you've been accept, you know, accepted and, I, and from then until now I keep thinking I think somebody made a mistake with that letter it shouldn't have been for me and, and that's how I've gone all my life really it's the, since the careers meeting when she said you must be realistic and I just I've had imposter syndrome so I still think every day are you sure it's me who should be here Did they, are, they, are those votes right no even when I was, you know, when you see the piles of votes, oh no, when, when I was winning, you think, no, there's something wrong here, this can't be right. But here I am. And you suppose, and you said that your therapy helped you say the glass was half full. I know. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, political question now. You're a big supporter of Keir Starmer yeah. in the leadership campaign. Yeah. Why did you resign as his, as his private secretary? I'll just explain. That's like being the eyes yeah. and ears of, yeah. of, the, of the lady who is... Menopause campaign, right. um, campaigning in general. I never want to be on the front bench. Yeah. I don't like the front bench. Right. It's just yeah. not, not for, for me. You're a so campaigner. I am a campaigner. I just like the freedom of being able to do what I want to do and say what I want to say and, and be me. Um, I think there's a lot in that. Mm. What advice would you give to new MPs who come in and think that it's all about getting on that front oh, bench? Take your time. Take your time. Learn to be you. You know, I do worry sometimes when new MPs come in and they've got something to say on everything. And I try to say to them, try to think about what really interests you and yeah. focus on that. Don't be, you know, jack of all trades. Try to be a master of one. But, you know, they, people will do what they want to do. And that would be my advice, would be to... To, and it won't be something that you think you're going to be interested in. It won't be something you were interested in before you came into politics. It'll be something that talk, uh, talks to you, that gets you there. Yeah. Yeah. Then you know that you've got the right thing. I think that's brilliant advice. Mm. And I think everyone should heed it because it's the only way, in my yeah. view, to be happy in that place. Mm. So you start going on that, oh. it, 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 there's no joy. No. You're, no, you, you're on, on a, a treadmill otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Carolyn. It's been such a pleasure to it's been listen lovely to, to see you, you and to see you and to, gosh, there's a lot of smiles that come from you. <laughs> you must be very, very strong. To well, no, I'm not, but I, I know I'm good, at, I'm good at covering it up. I've learned how to put the face on, on with the makeup, on with the face. Do you think you're depressed? I think I'm always depressed. Do you? Yeah. And do you think you always have been depressed? I think I always will be depressed. I've lost the biggest, you know, the, the day I lost Martin, half of me died with him. And I'll never, ever get over that. And I'll never be the person I was meant to be. We'll never know what she was or who she was. So the person that we left with is making the best out of half of what she was. That's very powerfully put. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, Karen.